Good morning. My name is Lyle Morris. Um, I'm a senior fellow for foreign policy and national security at the Center for China Analysis at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Thank you everyone for joining me this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this morning's uh, rapid reactions panel on the Taiwan presidential inauguration. <clears throat> As most of you know, on May 20th, Taiwan inaugurated Lai Qingde and Xiaobi Kim as president and vice president. During the inauguration, Lai gave his much anticipated inaugural address, laying out his vision for governing Taiwan, Taiwan's role in the world, and his thinking on cross-straits relations. The inaugural address of a president, especially a first-term president like Lai, is important for several reasons. First, it represents the first formal communication with the public and sets the tone for the president's policy priorities for Taiwan and its people. It's also regarded as one of the more important declarations on policies and priorities that will form the basis for cross-straits interactions between Taiwan and China. In essence, it gives us a sneak peek at what is to come for Lai's approach to cross-straits relations over the next four years. And also, it suggests what it might mean for stakeholders in Beijing, Washington, and beyond. So for this reason, I'm very happy and pleased to be joined by Dr. Simona Grano. Uh, Simona is a senior fellow on Taiwan at the Center for China Analysis, and also a senior lecturer and director of the Taiwan Studies Project at the University of Zurich. And Rory Daniels, managing director of the Asia Society Policy Institute and senior fellow at the Center for China Analysis. So Simona and Rory, thank you very much for joining me this morning. My pleasure for doing this. Yeah, thank you. So I know you two have been, like many of us, um, pouring over the lie address for clues and keywords and um, kind of um, trying to discern what he what his thinking is on a variety of issues. And um, I'd like to focus this webinar on the cross straits section of what he said. Um, I think he offered some pretty new and interesting language on cross straits. So uh, the focus of today's topic will be uh, a webinar will be on cross straits issues. Um, so really looking forward to hearing your two reactions and thoughts on the speech. Um, before we get started, just a note to the online audience. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And at the end, I will get to some of your questions and pose them to the panelists. Um, so we've got a lot to discuss. Rory and Simona, thank you again for joining me. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, kind of big picture um, after you've kind of absorbed Lai's speech, like what what are some of the key things that stood out to you about what he said, primarily on cross states issues, but also on any other issue you think that was important? Kind of what were your initial kind of 30,000 foot impressions of his speech? And Simona, maybe I'll start with you and then turn to Rory. I would jump right into it and say, actually, many things stood out, but we'll have time to talk about them. But I would start by actually singling out one key word in the speech, or rather concept, namely status quo, which, in my opinion, I interpret to be no unification with the mainland, of course, and no formal independence. That's what, in my opinion, he wanted to signal. But at the same time, I would also point out that his speech, if we compare it, especially with Tsai Ing-wen's first presidential speech in 2016, was clearly much less restrained. Um, he placed much more of a rhetorical emphasis or flair uh, on certain key differences between the mainland and Taiwan. And of course, he had much less a cautious and strategic dullness than she had, right? So I think that we can start by saying that in terms of greater emphasis that he you know, placed on the differences between the two, uh, these are the political ones. He mentioned the word democracy 31 times. And so I interpret that to want to a certain extent mark the difference with the past. He refers to his administration as the beginning of a new era on many fronts. And we'll talk about, for example, innovation at the domestic level later. But at the same time, I think that he wants to signal continuity with the previous president Tsai, something he has said many times even before the inaugural speech, especially for what concerns the maintenance of the status quo. And he does that specifically by really, on the one hand, mentioning this Zhonghua Mingwa, the Republic of China framework, 12 times in the speech. But also at the same time, he slowly builds up in the speech to the fact that no matter how one calls this land, no decision will ever be made without the will of the sovereign population of Taiwan. And so 
on one level, I think that, you know, the reference to the ROC is to be intended as a sort of olive branch to China. But at the same time, he clearly identifies with Taiwan and he pinpoints Taiwan as a sovereign nation that is not subordinated to the PRC, that is to be set on equal footing with the PRC. And these are, for him, clear precondition that transpires through the speech for any sort of relationship between the two sides of the strait. Um, OK, over to you, Roy. What, what are your kind of big picture takeaways? Sure. So I think my real big picture takeaway is how much the world has changed since Tsai Ing-wen became president in her first term in 2016. And I think that, you know, um, President Lai's speech really does both explicitly and implicitly highlight a growing divide in the world between democratic systems and other forms of government. Um, and it would, to me, what was starkest, what my key takeaway is, is how Lai is positioning Taiwan inside that bigger picture of the global scene. He, for example, says that this era is one of globalization and wide ranging competition. And as he outlines a future vision for Taiwan, um, I think quite compellingly outlines a future vision for where he wants to take Taiwan. He also comes back to this idea of Taiwan being part of a global community of democracies. So, for example, and, and indispensable to that global community um, of democracies. So, for example, he wants he says that Taiwan is a key player in supply chains for global democracies. I mean, to me, that is a really major difference now that we would not have seen in 2016 or even 2020 um, to be highlighting where Taiwan fits inside this wider geopolitical com competition and also to remind um, the world of the value of Taiwan um, and the value its political system has to a bigger, broader conversation in the world about how it should govern itself and how it should align um, in an era of intense geopolitical conflict. So uh, references, for example, to Ukraine and, you know, Ukraine's future being part of Taiwan's future. Again, these references that that in subtle ways carve out Taiwan as an asset to democracies only. Um, I thought that that was really stark, different and indicative of how much things have changed in the last eight years. That's, that's great. I'm really I'm. Um... Interesting you brought up Ukraine because as we transition to talk about cross straits, it was notable some of his language about China um, in relation to Russia and Ukraine. And um, so so on that issue, um, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of so because there's so much interesting language that lie unveils on cross straits, we're going to kind of take a piece by piece and um, start in the very beginning, kind of how he introduces cross straits and his language. Um, so. So Simone, as you mentioned, he he he's very straightforward and direct about um, you know, that Taiwan is, you know, the ROC, it's a sovereign independent nation. Um, and to quote, in which sovereignty lies in the hands of the people. So very much kind of tying it back to the people of Taiwan as as the, you know, as the primary um drivers of democracy and and the ones who get to decide. Um he states that, you know, he's he states a lot about international you know, co-opting and bringing in the international community into Taiwan, where you mentioned that the democracy part, which I think is is true. Um, so he talks about the Taiwan Straits is indispensable to global security and prosperity. He also states peace is the only option and prosperity gained through lasting peace and stability is our objective. From there, he <clears throat> talks about threats to peace, and he, he first outlines Russia and Ukraine. And then in the next sentence, he says um, about China that <clears throat> China's military actions are, uh, quote, considered the greatest strategic challenges to global peace and stability. Um, so his first reference to China is kind of in the context of military challenges in the, around the globe and kind of ties it to Russia and Ukraine, which I thought was notable. And then the next paragraph, he talks about um, the U.S. He, he says the Indo-Pacific Security Supplemental Appreciations Act in Congress um, in the context of how Taiwan can ensure peace and stability in the, in the Taiwan Strait. So his 
framing of the Taiwan Straits issues is sort of U.S. centric and also putting China in a bin of a threat, a military threat to to cross straits into Taiwan. So, you know, when you compare that to other inauguration speeches, I thought it was notable that his first kind of um, first time he raises China is in the context of the military threat. So kind of that part and the U.S. part, um, what do you what do you two take away from that framing um, as far as how it relates to cross straits issues? Um, Rory, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Well, I think the military aspect is really salient in Taiwan right now because of the events of the last two years. Um, and I think that the relationship between Taiwan and the U.S. is um, really is an important piece of emphasis for President Lai, who himself does not have the same types of kind of strong and enduring relationships with the U.S. policy community that his predecessor did. Now, that's not to say he hasn't covered, you know, his administration in ways that help him with the U.S., including selecting as vice president, um, Xiaobi Kim, who was uh, representing um, Taiwan unofficially in Washington um, for many years and has a long history with the U.S., including being a graduate, I believe, of Columbia University here in New York. So um, there's clearly credentials in his administration, but I wonder if some of the messaging on this was one, you know, was was really about um, making sure that the U.S. Uh, understood, the U.S. policy community understood Lai's commitment to that relationship, um, and also that it understood U.S. policy priorities, many of which, frankly, are about the defense of um, peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait against Chinese military incursions. So um, it's and and then there's the Taiwan domestic civil military relationship as well. And the DPP has never been seen as a party that has a particularly strong relationship with the military of Taiwan. And um, I wonder in some ways uh, that it's less that he wanted to signal the he wanted to signal to China that he's viewing things through this lens and through the context of potential conflict, um, but more that there's a sense that there's no need to um, accommodate, to cushion, to otherwise like you know frame things differently for the China context when his real constituents and his needs lie so much more in the unofficial relationship with the U.S. and in the internal um, civil military relationship. Simone, over to you. Same question. Right. Well, I think that here again, it's what Rory mentioned in the first question. He does it very cleverly in the specific passages that you mentioned, because here again, he does, as he does all throughout the speech, mention again that actually Taiwan is firmly uh, to be intended as a global player. It is of crucial importance for stability. He says it in the sentence of the future of Taiwan is uh, as important to the world as it is to the Taiwan's people. And I think that is, of course, a very clever way to make the world understand this is not just our own own business, but this is the business of the world, because if anything happens to us, the whole world stability and, of course, economic disruptions will be upon us, right? So he starts that way, but in regards to how he phrases China and the military threat, and then again, of course, the unofficial uh, relationship it has with the United States, I think I intend that to be a sort of a a clear-eyed approach to the fact that he's aware that cross-strait relations are, of course, a burning issue and, of course, the potential for conflict, you know, is there. And so cooperation between the two sides of the strait would be needed and he hopes for it. But at the same time, one should not be uh, naive as to understand that there is a threat that comes from the other side, an existential threat from Taiwan. And so it, it, I think it is a double pronged approach. They're offering it's a sort of peace offering, but at the same time, it's reminding its own domestic constituencies not to be swayed by external forces, as he says. Right. And in regards to the special relationship with the U.S., 
I think that, of course, signals a very similar approach to what he signals all throughout the speech in regards to like-minded uh, countries, like European countries and other democracies in the world. The fact that Taiwan will always need, especially in these times of gray zone tactics and heightened tension, the support of democratic countries to sort of counter China's growing attempts to isolate Taiwan from the international community, from international organizations, to exclude it from regional and international trade agreements through poaching of further diplomatic allies and as i said before this increase of gray zone tactics and of course in these terms of course the military also plays a role rory also talked about this but it is clear that i think in the years to come u.s presence on the island which of course to train taiwanese military which was non if i remember correctly officially in knowledge until 2021 will probably also grow will begin to encompass possibly also specialist training for a variety of things and we could also see more unofficial joint navy drills like the ones we saw when they by chance encountered each other in april 2024 so I think he's signaling there that he's continuing and hoping to continue to build on these unofficial ties that are growing, that have made Taiwan grow in internationalization in the past five years, while at the same time signaling to China that he's willing to talk if they are. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Um, so so kind of digging in a little bit deeper to his cross rates uh, proposals in his speech, um, you know, I it was it was quite distinct. I, I, what stood out to me was um, quite a clear distinction and difference from the Tsai um, Tsai Ing Wen's 2016 inaugural when he compared the two is quite striking. Um, so, as we mentioned, he talks a lot about um, the ROC Taiwan as a sovereign, independent nation. He, as you would expect, talks a lot about the ROC Constitution and his kind of mandate as being based from the ROC Constitution. Um, and so on that piece, he he kind of he references the first two clauses of the ROC Constitution. Then he says the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China uh, are not subordinate to each other. And I think that's what uh, Simona, you mentioned that piece, which I think is is a really important kind of proposal that that we've seen through the years of Taiwan pushing back, you know, different presidents pushing back on Beijing's proposal of the one country, two systems and um, that, you know, equality has to be the precondition for any Taiwanese president to engage with Beijing. Um, so he, he he didn't shy away from stating clearly the RC is an independent country and equality is the precondition for cross streets issues. So then he he kind of unveils some new policies and some 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 ideas. And one of them is called they call it the four commitments. Um, so there's four I, and I won't list all of them, but um, the one that's kind of salient to cross straits is uh, a stable and principled cross strait leadership so that's of his four commitments the third one talks about cross straits issues so you know he clearly is making he's talking about the word the keyword stability and status quo so those are the what i take away is you know two of the key kind of bases or foundations for cross straits issues so then he launched he kind of offers what i guess you consider would be an olive branch to beijing um, you know, he, he says, I hope that China will face the reality of the ROC's existence, respect the choices of the people of Taiwan uh, in good faith, choose dialogue over confrontation, exchange over containment, and under the principles of parity and dignity, engage in cooperation with the legal government chosen by the Taiwan's, Taiwanese people. He then proposes um, sort of like a, a proposal for engagements, very specific, talking about um resumption of tourism on a reciprocal basis, uh, enrollments of enrollment of degree students in Taiwan institutions. So he sort of gives a very direct, discreet proposal for how the two sides can start to, you know, build people, people exchanges and, and um, you know, collaboration. Um, but then, so this, and this, apologies for the long windup for this question, but there's, I think it's kind of putting these pieces together is interesting. So after that, he, he uh, ends with, well, first he ends with, let's uh, together pursue peace and mutual prosperity. His next passage says, as we pursue the ideal peace, we must not harbor any delusions. So long as China refuses to renounce the use of force against Taiwan, all of us in Taiwan ought to understand that even if we accept the entirety of China's position and give 
and give up our sovereignty, China's ambition to annex Taiwan will not simply disappear. That's a pretty strong statement um, from Lai about basically saying, you know, if China continues to hold on to its position and possibility of using force, that really like, you know, avenues for peace are very difficult. And China is, it's hard to trust China when it, if they hold on to this use of force clause. So, so all with that big windup and apologies, thank you for indulging me in that long windup, but kind of all those pieces together, um, Simona, what, what is your take on Lai's proposals about cross race issues? Um, what he said about, you know, the people who exchanges and, um, and then the last piece about kind of, you know, the, 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 the impediment or the challenge of peace, which is what he believes is China's refusal to give up use of force um, in extreme circumstances. What, what is your take on like all of that? I mean, from a direct perspective, obviously you had to offer something because otherwise you're also fodder for the opposition to criticize you because you're not doing enough to keep tensions down. But on a more um, pragmatic uh, analysis level, I have to say, I think that the passages you quoted want to show from his side that he's ready to dialogue with China, but that he's also aware and so should the Taiwanese people that ultimately it does not depend on him, but it depends on China, whether tensions will diminish or not. And so he tries to frame the issue in an attempt to sort of co-op China into this peaceful coexistence strategy that would be beneficial to both sides of the strait, but also to a peaceful um, and Pacific, um, Indo-Pacific, sorry, and, yeah, Pacific in the sense of tranquil Indo-Pacific, but also for the world and shifts, of course, the emphasis to democracy. But ultimately, I think it also reminds in the passage you quoted the Taiwanese that they should not be naive in trusting China to a certain extent because we don't know how they will react. And we have already seen how they have reacted to his speech anyway. We'll talk more about that. But let me just say one final thing, which I thought was quite interesting. And I have not seen this mentioned in, in media articles I have read or commentary on the speech. And it is that he makes straight away from the very beginning an important reference to the past that I think should be understood as a sort of way up call for the future and he makes it right at the very beginning when he starts talking about Taiwan's dark history under the authoritarian regime of the Kuomintang. This is the link with China and of course that he's reminding us of from the 1949 imposition of martial law, which also took place on May 20th. And as you mentioned in the intro call, of course, also the first direct presidential elections, which also took place in 96, when a Taiwanese was elected, also on May 20. So I think that the symbolism you know, of this date should not be actually, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that it is crucial because to a certain extent, I think with that symbolism, he's reminding the Taiwanese people and the world that they have already gone through a very painful journey from the years of white terror caused from a party that originally came from mainland China until the lifting of martial law and the slow establishment of this vibrant democracy. And I think that this actually is a wake up call on his side to remind the people that they are aware of what it means to be ruled by an authoritarian regime, a one party regime. And that should be, you know, a wake, a wake up call not to fall prey to another similar situation in the future. Hence, right after, of course, the mentioning of uh, Republic of China as a sovereign and independent nation in which sovereignty lies in the hands of the people. Hmm. Roy, what do you think? Well, I, um, Really appreciate Simona's comments on this topic and talking a little bit about the symbolism of the date um, and particularly highlighting how domestic politics in Taiwan may push through proposals that seem relatively low hanging fruit, right? Like tourism, student exchange should be non-sensitive topics, but I would take just like a slightly different view on this and say from Beijing's perspective, these are actually incredibly sensitive topics, right? I am less convinced that these proposals were offered in good faith to dialogue. I don't see um, the Lai administration um, seriously taking on the possibility or setting themselves up for any sort of dialogue that is not completely on their own terms. And while I 
am sympathetic to a lack of reciprocity on the Chinese side to create the right conditions for that dialogue. Absolutely sympathetic to that. Um, there's nothing in the appointments in his administration and the speech itself that suggests to me anything other than the Lai administration has kind of thrown up their hands and said it would be impossible to have this dialogue under these circumstances. Um, that's not to say that the two sides of the strait shouldn't pursue tourism or student exchanges and other things. But from the PRC's perspective, all of this talk about transitional justice um, the talk about, you know, the symbolism of the date, the, the the education system itself, less so at the university level, but certainly at the primary level, is a major source of anxiety for the PRC. And the reasons are manifold, but for me, the most important reason is this. It really matters in Beijing how Taiwan reunifies with the mainland. And I'm not just talking about like, does it ever happen? Yes, that matters. But it also matters how. I mean, I do not see a politically salient um, strategy for mainland China to take Taiwan by force and for that political, those political actors that made that decision to survive it. If there is a war in the Taiwan Strait, which I think we all understand would be devastating, absolutely devastating, not just to the people on both sides of the strait, but to the global economy. Um, and you have Chinese people killing other Chinese, you know, in their minds, like other people from the same family. Um, that's really, really uh politically quite dangerous. So from Beijing's point of view, this issue of Taiwan identity, of Taiwan identifying as something separate from the mainland, and there's a huge part of the speech just on Taiwan identity, which goes into some of the different ways that you can discuss um, how to conceptualize the nation of Taiwan. Is it, you know, ROC Taiwan, other, other um, pieces of it? That gets to the core of Beijing's um, deep anxiety about the future of unification, because if the if Taiwan really if the people of Taiwan really start to see themselves as separate and separated, it is very difficult for Beijing to imagine how it would win hearts and minds in a way that would allow it to reunify by with Taiwan um, through peaceful means. Um, so I offer all of that up as just contextualization of some of these things, even proposals that seem on the surface to be fairly benign or low hanging, um, contain this hidden context in it that if you, you know, don't have the history of cross strait relationships and you don't have kind of your finger on the pulse of how Beijing sees them, um, might seem like olive branches, but are in fact, um, I think, pretty mixed signals um, born out of, frankly, frustration from the Taiwan side that there's really anything they can do um, to, you know, to improve the cross-strait relationship in and of themselves. I'm or any, sorry, anything they're willing to do to improve the cross-strait relationship, including, you know, taking down some of those education campaigns and other things. That was not in the speech. Very clear signal that those things will continue. Thanks, Rory. Yeah, I'm, I want to pull the thread a little bit. I, I'm really glad you brought up kind of Beijing's perspective because I want to get into that a little bit. Um, and it got, I mean, after I read the the address, it got me thinking and I pulled up the Tsai Ing wens 2016 inaugural address and I read it and I, I it was very, um, what really stuck out to me was the difference in Tsai's olive branch to Beijing versus Lai's in 2024. And I get that, you know, Lai is different from Tsai, even though they're both in DBP. I, I, Lai wants to have his own stamp on things. But when you read the total speech of Lai and then compare it to Tsai, um, the biggest thing that stuck out to me was, I mean, Tsai makes a nod to the 1992 consensus. She doesn't say the word, but she says, you know, we'll work on to maintain existing mechanisms for dialogue. Uh, communications across the strait, and then she kind of gives a nod to the, in 1992 that the, the two sides met and negotiated, and um, there's you know joint understanding. So that so, and then she says, "I respect that historical fact." So even though at the time Beijing said, "Oh, this is not a passing grade," you know, they famously said it didn't didn't pass the grade. Um, but you know, when you look at her speech and you look at Lai, Lai doesn't really propose anything close that would meet Beijing's 
requirements or expectations that would allow the two sides to to you know have dialogue and to to kind of have engagement. Now, I'm sure Lai knew that and he he had his you know audience that he wanted to appeal to, but but just I wonder if you put yourself in Beijing's shoes, whether they look back at the 2016 inaugural of Tsai Ing-wen and they think it's was it a missed opportunity? Did they do they have a good thing with a DPV president then that they don't have now and they might not ever get? Um, so just comparing Lai's speech to to Tsai's in 2016, what 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 are your impressions about how I mean we'll get to Beijing's kind of response a little bit, but just like the olive branch that Lai gave to Beijing, what what how would you interpret it if you're in Beijing? Do you think it's not even close to um are are they disappointed or are they is it did it not you know, obviously it didn't meet their expectations, but just comparing it to Tsai, Tsai Ing-wen, I'm curious what your guys' take is. Um, maybe, Rory, I'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I start again where I started from before. Like, the world has changed and moved on um, since 2016. I don't know if Beijing has regrets. I doubt it. Um, I think that their bottom line has been relatively consistent, that the DPP, as long as it has in its party plank, there's nothing to do with Tsai or Lai particularly, as long as the DPP party has as a plank of its party charter that it's pursuing Taiwan independence, it cannot work with the DPP um, party. And the party in government, out of government, doesn't matter. Like That is the kind of Beijing bottom line. Um, that creates a barrier to access. Now, there were, I think, attempts um, to facilitate, you know, quiet diplomatic dialogue between the two sides of the strait in the run up to the 2016 inauguration to see if there was any flexibility on just, you know, maybe we can't have political dialogue. And frankly, I'm not sure that's something Taiwan even wanted. Um, but perhaps we can at least keep the the tensions cooler by um, providing another way to look at the um, the cross strait situation that would adhere to the 1992 consensus, um, one China with different interpretations. Um, so a lot of what Tsai said in her inaugural speech referenced back to the meetings, the exchanges in 1992. She never said 1992 consensus because it has the one China aspect of it that's very difficult for a DPP leader to voice. It's not in the, um, you know, there's not a lot of political support in the DPP for, for saying things like one China, um, even with different interpretations. But actually, like the world is so moved on from that now that um, not even I think the KMT would really lead with the 1992 consensus. It's been so conflated with um, one country, two systems that it's not politically popular in Taiwan anymore. And I think even a KMT leader, you know, Time was turned back, and a KMT leader, KMT leader was giving the inaugural speech today. Would also struggle to to kind of repeat even language that was popular um, uh, when Tsai Ing Wen was was inaugurated in 2016. Um, you know, Beijing's really boxed itself into a corner with this policy. My concern is that as the Lai administration, from my perspective, and particularly through the speech. Um, also lays down kind of hard lines and bottom lines about how it wants to deal with the mainland, that there's just simply no room for flexibility on either side. And it's not good for cross-strait relations, obviously, um, to have that kind of hard line stuck in positioning on things. Um, and it also gives the U.S. and other like-minded democracies around the world kind of an outsized role in cross-strait relations as countries, entities, um, organizations that have unofficial relationships perhaps with Taipei, but also official relationships with Beijing. Um, so I think on the whole, we are looking at um, a, a frozen status quo at best in the Taiwan Strait in the coming years and, and very little flexibility for actual dialogue on either side. Simona, over to you. Right. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. I mean, in regards to your initial question, whether they think that they missed an opportunity to dialogue back in 2016 with Tsai Ing-wen, I don't think that Beijing sees it that way. I think for them, no matter who 
is the leader, it is the wrong party. They don't want to dialogue with the DPP, but there are a lot of comments also by political commentators and especially specialists of the Taiwan-China issue in China that have mentioned before the elections, even before January, that they were concerned about Lai's character because, of course, of his comments when he was mayor of Tainan in the direction of pro-independence. There were a lot of commentators in China who said that Tsai Ing-wen, because of her more dull, to a certain extent, more moderate approach, was possibly preferred, and they were concerned about Lai. So I think the party is the wrong party, but in regards to the character of the two presidents, there is some concern there. But that being said, I think that, you know, we keep talking about China. China certainly is concerned about what is going on in general, about the trajectory and the trend in Taiwan. Um, I think, however, that he lie is also reflecting not just his attitude towards China, but I think what we need to keep in mind is that he's a politician with a very difficult job because, of course, he needs to be, keep stability with China in times of unprecedented tension. He needs to keep his electorate content and also the more radical wing of the DPP, which would want it to be more outspoken like when he was mayor of Tainan, but he's the president of all the Taiwanese. So he needs to also please the majority of the people and thus be more moderate. And I think this framing of the situation made it very difficult for him to actually make a speech with these conflicting views. In the end, the speech was very clear, in my opinion, and quite outspoken, and certainly also reflects domestic tendency in the sense that between 2016 and 2024 today, we have seen rising identity among especially younger generations with people that increasingly more identify as only Taiwanese. So clearly in certain phrases, when he talks about Taiwan, our motherland, or later on, I think there is one passage when he says, as long as we identify with Taiwan, Taiwan belongs to all of us, the people of Taiwan, regarding or regardless of the ethnicity uh, or when we arrived on the island. These are things that for China are a really bad news, as Rory was mentioning before, because, of course, they interpret them as an, as an effort to decinicize Taiwan. And even when he talks about the Republic of China, I think they think that he's trying to make this framework more Taiwanese, pursuing a sort of Taiwanese independence in disguise without saying it out loud. So I think the geopolitics, but also the domestic tendencies of rising Taiwanese identities should be considered when we talk about why he phrased certain, certain things the way he did. Mm. That's great. Thank you, too. Um, so you... You touched on another issue that I want to move to before I move to domestic politics, which is the name of Taiwan. So one thing he said that was interesting to me was he said, some call this land Republic of China, some call it the Republic of China, Taiwan, and some Taiwan. But whichever of these names we ourselves are or our international friends choose to call our nation, we will resonate and shine all the same. Um, I mean, in one sense, that's not a controversial thing to say, but in another sense, if you're Beijing, I wonder if that is controversial. In other words, I wonder if they interpret that as kind of quietly opening the door for the different names of Taiwan, um, whether it's ROC, ROC Taiwan, or Taiwan. So I wonder how that's, I mean, probably we all guess, could guess it's not gonna be, you know, go over well in Beijing, but um, that phrase, I'm just curious what you two thought of that. And then also something that someone you just raised, which is at the end of his speech, Lai says, um, I want to ask each fellow citizen to praise our mother, Taiwan, the land that nurtures and supports us all, and to work together to protect her, honor her, let the world embrace her, and allow her the international respect she deserves as a great nation. Um, again, I've never seen that in an inaugural speech, the the use of mother, mother Taiwan. Um, and of course, we all know, you know, China refers to itself as the motherland. And that has significance when it comes to reunification, because, you know, they say they use the term motherland as a kind of means that Taiwan returns back to the motherland. So here, Lai uses mother, mother Taiwan um, in the context of Taiwan. So those two phrases, do either of those two phrases stick out to you as being controversial or to be expected or kind of what what do you to think about those two two phrases um maybe someone i'll start with you and then to rory 
Yeah, I mean, I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I would kind of go in the direction of what I just told you. I think they are controversial for Beijing. These possibly two passages you just mentioned are the ones that are very a source of irritation to Beijing because they really highlight, in my opinion, the identification that Lai urges the people to have with Taiwan, with the motherland. And as you said, of course, we often hear in the speeches by Xi Jinping about Taiwan and China being one family, about being indivisible, about being, of course, brothers and so on and so forth. And so I think that on one level, of course, he paid lip service to the cause of keeping tensions low by mentioning even more than Tsai Ing-wen did the ROC etiquette, right? The Zhonghua Ming, Mingguo uh, name. But at the same time, I think he truly disguises what he thinks towards the end of the speech when he talks about Taiwan as our motherland. And of course, he keeps the channel open with China by mentioning the ROC. But again, as I said before, I think that the very strong identification with Taiwan is really um, palpable all throughout the speech and is something that is really a cause of irritation to Beijing, because as I said before, it, they perceive it as, a, as an attempt to further detach Taiwan from China in history, in ethnicity, in culture, and so on and so forth. Mm. Rory? Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I think it's incredibly sensitive. I think that, you know, the you know, the issue of Taiwan identity is becoming internationalized through the use of different names for Taiwan. So, you know, we know, for example, that um Lithuania opened a uh, an office called the Taiwanese Representative Office um, a, a couple years ago and faced immediate economic, massive economic coercion from China just over the use of that name. And the reason that the name is so sensitive is for all of the um, the points that Simona just outlined. It's because it's not just about, you know, how you casually refer to something. It's about the separateness of calling the nation Taiwan as opposed to the Republic of China. Um, the Republic of China is um, not a construct that I think Beijing is super happy remains around, um, but it still says China and it still kind of speaks back to a separation that happened in 1949 that could get resolved. Mm -hmm. um, Taiwan is something different and something new. And I think that that's something that Lie in the DPP very much feel uh, is a part of their their political journey and political success is to um, you know to really think of Taiwan differently and not necessarily just a post forty nine um, construct but really a construct that was codified in the nineteen ninety six elections. Um, and it's really more about Taiwan's identity as a democracy with democratic values, with an open society, um, with a progressive civil society. And he notes, you know, that he plans to work on gender equality and some issues that have been controversial even in Taiwan over the years. Um, that's a huge part of it. So, so the language is almost the even though it seems simple, like we call things one thing or another, what it signifies, what it brings up, how it frames Taiwan in the international system is deeply important and probably very upsetting to Beijing um, that would very much prefer um, that, you know, Taiwan did not have relationships overseas um, that are separate from Beijing's control. Um, okay, let me turn to domestic politics uh, briefly. So Lai uh, acknowledged the lack of a majority, absolute majority in the, in the legislative UN. Um, he kind of puts a positive spin on it. He says, you know, lack of absolute majority means that the ruling and opposition parties are now able to share their ideas and that will be undertaking the nation's challenges as, as one. Um, and he says, Taiwan's people have high expectations for rational governments among political parties. So he kind of calls for, you know, as you would expect, a cooperative spirit uh, for domestic policy making. Um, and then he says, you know, the majority should respect the minority while the minority accepts majority rule. Uh, only then can we avoid conflict and maintain a stable, harmonious society. Um, curious 
what you think about that language related to you know the the very clear challenges that's going to that the DPP has in um, making domestic uh, policies, passing legislation with the KMT and the TPP. Um, and the second piece was kind of he 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 referenced a lot of new domestic um, uh, kind of agenda items. Uh, he talked about uh, AI. He he actually said the use of phrase AI island. He wants Taiwan to become an AI island. Um, he talked about economic model driven by innovation. Um, we talked a lot about supply chains, um, climate change, and then of course housing prices and and increasing wages, which you know seem to be the some of the key kind of hot button issues that uh, that citizens of Taiwan um, you know care about and and talked about in the run to the election. So. Just kind of your overall take on the domestic agenda that he proposed in the in the speech. What what stood out to you? What what do you think was notable? Um, maybe Roy, I'll start with you. Um, I think it was notable that he referenced conversations and um, data gathering information collection that he's done with the private sector and private industry in Taiwan as part of this economic strategy. Um, again, I think like, the DPP has traditionally been seen as a party that was separated somewhat from the business community and therefore less able to handle so, and tackle some of the challenges that the business community faces. Um, he definitely laid out a very ambitious agenda, including making Taiwan the number one place for unarmed aerial vehicles, drones, um, for democracies, very specifically, um, another place where the, the modifier of democracy seems to be important. Um, but also, I think a lot of these issues are wrapped up intimately in thorny domestic politics. For example, um, I do not know how Taiwan becomes an AI island without resolving major power issues, electricity issues. Um, it has simultaneously, even, you know, it's an island nation, it imports a lot of its energy needs, its energy mix. Um, but it's also for domestic political reasons due to the disaster in Fukushima. Um, it is also committed to phasing out nuclear power. So where do you get, you know, the, and it was all mentioned in one paragraph too, which was amazing, a commitment to Taiwan's net zero goals and this need to like resolve the power sector, but also to become an AI island. Um, I think these are issues that are going to continue. You know, these are issues that every Taiwan government has faced. Uh, shortages of electricity, uh, water, um, other, you know, resources that are needed to kind of like advance heavy industry. And um, it's going to be a much tougher fight for him um, to get some of these agenda items passed if uh, domestic contentious domestic policy, policies and partisanshipness becomes a key part of the discussion. Um, I'll end by saying that, you know, I thought his references to majority minority was really, really interesting because I wasn't sure who he was referring to as the majority and who he was referring to as the minority with the split government where the DPP is in power and controls the legislative uh, I'm sorry, the executive branch and um, the KMT with untraditional partnerships um, has a majority in the LY. Uh, I, I wasn't totally sure where that message was intended to head, but um, I'm sure I think, you know, most of the people in Taiwan, um, even when they are uh, really, you know, deeply invested in um, their own political party, uh, do want to see Taiwan advance in the direction that Lai laid out and hopefully want to see, um, you know, the the two and three parties coming together to advance that agenda. Mona, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I also wasn't sure exactly in regards to the majority minority. I think that was also, of course, a very clear reference that he acknowledged the difficulties going on and taking as a reference what happened last Friday. I don't know if, if the public, everyone is aware, but of course, it, it was a brawl, basically. And of course, um, I think that that was a clear reference to the fact that he's aware that this divisive climate could actually very likely characterize the next four years of his presidency. And, and, and therefore, what Rory said takes on even more of an importance in the sense that all the things that he laid out in the speech 
And I think here there's, again, a double sort of um, dimension, the domestic dimension of what it plans to do to increase, of course, both Taiwan's competitiveness, but also all the problems, the salaries and the domestic recession. But there is also an external dimension of attracting more investments and also, of course, of continuing to stress how important Taiwan is for the world because of all the things that he mentioned, including, of course, artificial intelligence, surveillance technology and semiconductors in which Taiwan already actually covers a huge, a huge, a hugely important role for the world. So I think here again there was this double dimension, domestic and international, and also the referencing to the fact that he's aware that likely in the years to come there will be need for a lot of cooperation among three parties, and so he hopes, of course, in the responsibility of all those concerned. But it is, we'll, we'll see what will happen. Hmm. Um, we've got. 10 minutes left. I want to get to some audience Q&A, but, um, and I see a few questions about kind of how the speech will be uh, interpreted in Beijing and how Beijing might respond. So maybe I'll use those questions as a, as a way to ask you to, um, I mean, looking at your crystal ball, if you're sitting in Beijing and you, you see the speech, is, is what Lai said, do, do you, did you expect him? I mean, there's kind of two, Two thing, you know, two uh, two ideas or two trains of thought. One is they completely expected it. They didn't think he was going to say much that would be uh, make Beijing happy, and so they prepared their uh, policies and talking points um, in you know in reaction to that. Another is they were quite worried and, and angry about what he said about you know Taiwan's identity and using the word Taiwan and the motherland, and um, and so there may be you know, rethinking how they're going to approach. I mean, obviously, they are probably not going to continue to have any engagement with with DPP. We, we know that. But as far as like their follow on reactions, as far as rhetoric and, and actions, um, what are your what is your two cents of um, how Beijing will interpret this speech and what we can expect in the next four years? Uh, Simone, why don't I start with you first? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that Beijing will continue definitely to refuse to talk and engage, as we said, in any form of dialogue with the DPP. And I think in this specific case, especially seeing what happened last Friday in the parliament with the brawl, I think that Beijing hopes that he will be able to further split the Taiwanese democracy in the years to come by taking advantage of the split parliament and employing this sort of divide and conquer strategy. I think that the CCP will make show of its willingness to continue to dialogue with the Kuomintang and possibly also with the TPP. We have seen Ma ying going to China uh, one month ago and continue to marginalize the DPP. And possibly in the months to come, I think that the CCP will revive its standpoint that the DPP is electorally weakened and does not represent the majority of the voters. But that being said, I think that any fundamental strategy by China towards Taiwan, any fundamental change of strategy is actually quite unlikely, at least until it becomes known who becomes the winner of the U.S. presidential elections in November. And other than that, I think how China behaves towards Taiwan in the next few months will really also depend on how the Lai presidency develops and on how many problems it will have in managing the parliament. So I think it is likely that uh, China will be more pacified and more content in the months to come if Lai has domestic troubles. And also geopolitics and the relationship between China and the U.S. will play a role on how Beijing will act. We're more likelihood of tensions if the U.S. and Europe continue to improve their own relationship with Taiwan. And what we will certainly continue to see on the side of China in the months and years to come is really a continuation of the current gray zone tactics that China has been employing, and especially after January uh, elections, uh, which will continue China, will allow to China to continue to meddle in Taiwan's affairs, but in a less obvious way until, as I said, at least the outcome of the US election is known. And of course, at this moment, maybe China still has a vested interest in keeping things a bit more quiet. Hmm. Rory, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, first of all, completely agree with everything Simona said. She laid it out beautifully. So I have very little to add except to emphasize that I think the U.S.-China relationship is a really important determinant here. And, um, you know, the, uh, the willingness of, um, the willingness of Beijing to, uh, 
keep things calm, I think really is shaped by the U.S.-China relationship and how it's going. I honestly think um, there is there's part of Beijing's reaction that's specific to Lai himself to this speech, to the evolving situation across the strait, to domestic politics in Taiwan. And then I think there's a bigger, broader strategic picture that's exemplified by how Lai positioned Taiwan in this speech. And it's it's not clear to me if the kind of attempts to restart diplomacy between the US and China and where they are today to message the kind of no surprises um, policy decisions that allow both for confrontation and competition as, as much as dialogue and collaboration um, it's not clear to me how that's going to play in the context of cross-strait relations. I think for a long time, Beijing had considered, for example, um, U.S.-China military and defense dialogue as not a guardrail to the relationship, but a seatbelt by which the U.S. could be more and more provocative um, and stabilize things through that channel of dialogue. The U.S. and Chinese defense counterparts, um, Secretary Austin and his counterpart, are going to meet in a couple of weeks in Shangri-La. And I'm starting to think, as I see Xi and Putin meet together, um, you know, close in time to this inauguration, as we hear that they'll meet again around the same time of the NATO summit in the United States in July, that perhaps Beijing is also taking on this idea that um, US, the U.S.-China relationship and the dialogue that's been established at the official level can be a seatbelt for them too, to do more and more provocative things. So I'm really looking toward that meeting at the Shangri-La dialogue in two weeks to see if there will be some sort of military uptick in the cross-strait relationship that would point to um you know, Beijing using U.S.-China rapprochement as as the opportunity um, to to escalate in what it sees as like a a safe or um, reciprocal way. Mm. All right, we have four minutes left. I'm going to get one more question in from the audience, um, and this is a question about Taiwan's international partnerships. Um, so the question is. What do you think the Lai administration, how successful would they be in forging new partnerships, maintaining their current partnerships, i.e. their diplomatic uh, allies? Um, and, you know, given the message of democracy that he, that Lai emphasized, do you think that um, countries are going to be more or less willing to engage Taiwan based on what he said in his presidency, or will they still you know, be deterred and worried about upsetting Beijing. So kind of like the 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 alliance of democracy kind of language and wanting to forge more international space. What do you th what do you think of his and Taiwan's um, kind of pr prospects are in the next four years? Uh, Roy, maybe I'll start with you and then end with Simona. Sure, I'll, I'll be very brief. I don't think much has changed. I think this has long been um, Taiwan's kind of self-defined value add to the world, that they have a democratic system, that they have an open society, that they um, are quite effective as a democracy in dealing with major kind of perhaps public health crises, and for example, the COVID situation, um, and that that makes them deserving of a seat at the table where those issues are being discussed in the international arena. Um, the bigger determinant here is going to be what is the future of international institutions? Can they survive a more multipolar world? Can they survive intense strategic competition, um, perhaps strategic competition that will intensify in the coming years due to um, electoral choices in the US? Uh, as well as China's own kind of sense of um, anxiety in its neighborhood that's pushing it towards uh, closer relationships with with Russia and other actors that the you know are deeply opposed and um, have are deeply opposed to to the Western world of democracies. So all of those factors are swirling around. And um, fundamentally, I don't think the speech does anything more than highlight for the global community um, that sense of Taiwan's value add that's been growing over time. 
Simona, you have the last word and then we'll wrap up. Okay, thank you. So I'll be brief. I think in terms, for example, I'll take Europe since I'm sitting here in Europe. And I think there's been certainly a more and a bigger engagement with Taiwan, especially on topics that Rory has mentioned, intensification of contacts with a focus on crisis management because of the corona pandemic and, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But despite this more increased normative and rhetorical engagement with Taiwan, actually, I think that most EU states are quite careful trying to avoid a trade backlash from China still now. So you got actually parliamentarians, especially European parliamentarians, pushing to boost relations. But the position of the EU in general has not changed that much from what it was in the past. And so I think that going forward, we shall see William Lai and his presidency uh, keen on pursuing further the goal of a trade deal with Europe. But the concrete possibility, for example, of this specific thing happening is very low, not just because of hesitancy on the part of Europeans, but also because Lai does not have what we said before, the parliamentary majority. And so it is very likely that the KMT and the TPP will have substantial weight in hindering any agreement that they perceive as going against their own respective approaches to foreign policy and for the KMT specifically as increasing tensions with the PRC. And I, I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you, you two, so much. This has been a great conversation. There's, there's uh, You teed up a lot of uh, issues that we are going to, you know, watch closely as, as kind of the fallout of Lai's, um, you know, speech and the and the the ripple effects of what he said kind of takes effect in in around the world and um, really appreciate your insights. Um, so yeah, we're going to conclude now. Just want to flag for for those interested, the ASPI has a new Taiwan um, hub that where you can find kind of all activities and events and papers related to Taiwan. Um, it's called Taiwan's Past and Future: Complexity and Cons contestation um, and that's on the ASPE website and you can also sign up please for the newsletter and for um, events um, our email uh, through the um, ASPE uh, email portal so please sign up if you're interested um, so Simona and Rory thank you very much for for participating for your insights and thank you to the online audience for your questions and again um, looking forward to follow on discussions about this and, and thanks everyone for joining thank you Thank you. Bye-bye.